So good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. And uh, welcome to today's symposium. I want to say thank you to many colleagues and friends who have come from all over the world to join us. We are really delighted that you are here for today's discussions. And a welcome also to um, everybody who is watching online. For those who are uh, in the room, uh, usually we have um, several hundred people watching online, about twice as many people online as we have in the room. And we try to engage them mostly through Twitter. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this symposium is part of a series of programming we host at the school. And in particular, this one is around urban health, which is one of the school's four key research areas. M much of our work in the school ultimately concerns the health of urban populations, the drivers of the health of urban populations, and what we can do to improve them. So having the occasion to bring together experts from all over the world about understanding cities and understanding how we can create healthier cities is really an intellectual high point for us. So thank you. Thank you all for joining us. A couple of thank yous from my end. Today's event would not have been possible without the partnerships of our event co-hosts, the Boston University Initiative on Cities and the Yale Institute for Global Health. The BU Initiative on Cities works with urban leaders, policymakers, and academics from around the world to help cities flourish. This initiative has long been a close partner of our school, and we are very lucky to have it at Boston University. And special thanks to Graham Wilson and Catherine Lusk for their leadership of the initiative and their work on cities. A thank you also goes to the staff who make such events happen, in particular the Dean's Office staff led by Catherine Etman and the uh, communication staff uh, led by Kara Peterson. Thank you all for uh, what you do. And um, really, a big thank you to our partners at the uh, Yale Institute for Global Health and School of Nursing and uh, my good friend and colleague David Vlahov. David is the Associate Dean for Research and Professor at the Yale School of Nursing with a joint appointment in Epidemiology and Public Health. He also co-directs the National Program Office for the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation Culture of Health Evidence for Action Program. And David and I have been friends and colleagues for a very long time. David, welcome. Sandra, thank you so much for opening your house to be able to have this conference and to bring together such a great group of people. And I'm looking forward very much to the day. So about four decades ago, the Chinese settlement of Shenzhen had a was a modest fishing village and had a population of about 30,000 people. Now it's a city of 10 million people. This dramatic growth reflects a global trend. More people are living in cities now than ever before. A hundred years ago, it was about 10% of the population around the world was urban. And in 2007, it was half, right? And we're looking at 2030, it'll be almost two-thirds of the population. So the world's really been rapidly and steadily uh, urbanizing. The urban environment is a ubiquitous exposure for health. Cities shape what we eat, what we drink, breathe, the level of noise that we hear, the amount of exercise that we get, our social networks, the safety of our neighborhoods, and many other exposures that are core to health. For this reason, the future of cities is, in many ways, the future of health. How we create health in urban contexts will do much to decide how healthy the global community will be. Today brings together scholars from around the world for a discussion of how we can promote urban health by advancing scholarship about health in cities. Presenters will examine case studies showing how cities have invested in health and synthesize the state of the science around this issue. I look forward to learning from each of them throughout the day and also seeing people that we've worked with over decades together. And so it's a reunion in many ways. So what I would like to do is to introduce the first panel moderator Kelly Henning, who is the public health program lead for the Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you, thank you very much, David. It's great to be here, and, th and thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be able to moderate this panel on city trends. I thought I'd just start for a second talking for a moment about city work at Bloomberg Philanthropies, because I don't know many of you, and perhaps you're not so familiar with our work as well. Um, it turns out that Bloomberg Philanthropies has a very, very deep focus on cities. And actually, all of the programs that we work with um, in the philanthropy, the, the five that are listed there on the slide in the lower left, have city engagements. And these are the cities around the world where we all work. <laughs> 
Um, in the public health program, which I lead, we focus very much on non-communicable diseases and injury prevention. And our global programs that are supported are also listed here on this slide on, on the right-hand side. Um, and you can see that we have this entity called Partnership for Healthy Cities that we've just begun two years ago. We see cities as a major accelerator. So although we work at national level, we use cities to accelerate progress, particularly on policy work that we support around the world. Our focus is very much on low and middle income countries. We also demonstrate progress um, and really try to capture the information that we learn in our programs that are supported in the, at the city level. <clears throat> this is just a, uh, a snapshot of the Partnership for Healthy Cities. We have 54 cities in this network around the world. Um, these cities have chosen to work in a particular area. area that's, those are listed on the left side of the slide. And those cities that work in those areas re receive some monetary support, but also quite a lot of technical assistance and engagement. And we're just now beginning to capture the outcomes of this work in these cities around the world. As I mentioned, we consider this a network, and although there's some funding attached, it's really quite minimal. It's more about engaging and learning city to city. So there's a lot of peer learning that's going on in this network. And just one example is Kampala, Uganda. We've been working at the national level in Uganda for a number of years, more than five years, on a smoke-free air act. They have that, that air act in place. It's quite, it's quite comprehensive and it's quite good, but it's never been implemented. So we use the Partnership for Healthy Cities to, to start in the city of Kampala to try to work with city officials to get that, to get that in place and actually are having quite a lot of success. So it's just one very brief example of how we're using cities to catalyze all of our work in the public health space. So with that, I just want to again acknowledge how exciting it is to, to have this panel of experts here today to talk about city trends and the science, and I'm very excited myself to learn from all of them. We're not going to do introductions person by person. I'm just going to ask that Patricia Ocampo start us off and then each person come up one by one and give their presentation, at which point we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience up here all together. So Patricia, could you start us off? Good morning, and uh, thank you to the organizers um, for inviting me and uh, to Sandro and David uh, for thanks uh, giving me and my co-authors uh, the opportunity to participate uh, and to contribute to the to the book. Um, so I'm going to start us out by talking about uh, inequities in cities uh, and uh, also urban health. Um, when I say inequities, I'm talking about those inequalities that are systemic and uh, socially produced, and therefore they're avoidable and unjust. Um, and we see these inequities everywhere in all cities um, all over the globe. Uh, they may manifest differently, for example, in low-income uh, countries than they do in middle-income countries, but we do see these inequities uh, everywhere. And um, what I'd like to do this morning is not really focus on kind of the numbers uh, to show you patterns and prevalence of different kinds of inequities. My understanding is that some of the other authors are going to be doing that. Um, but um, I, we've really been asked to explain why these inequities occur. Uh, and so not really getting into numbers, let me see if I can do this. Um, uh, I think what, uh, so sorry, we want to explain why these inequities occur to inform solutions, right? Because I think we're all here not just to uh, look at the gaps, but really to formulate solutions uh, to the inequities. Um, so uh, I'll give you some examples of where some of these inequities uh, occur, but again, not really getting too much into the numbers. Uh, so let me see if this works. There we go, yeah. So one of the areas that we see inequities in cities is in the area of food. Um, so food, um, we could be food safety. We've been hearing some um, and experiencing uh, some food safety issues as of late. Uh, but certainly for decades, we've been seeing uh, trends and inequities in the area of food insecurity. Um, it's certainly been growing, and uh, we see gradients in food security in many cities. Another area is the housing crisis. Uh, there's no doubt that 
all major large cities in North America are experiencing housing affordability crises. Um, and uh, uh, it's very difficult for somebody with an average or a low income to actually live in some of these large cities because really all the building that is going on now and all the gentrification is geared toward housing for high income individuals. Uh, so I know that we're experiencing that in Toronto and again in many large cities across North America. Um, certainly issues with transportation are a problem everywhere, uh, whether it's lack of bike lanes in the right places, for example, low income communities to uh, costly or perhaps um, public, inf uh, public transportation, which is failing in inf infrastructure uh, and uh, not really taking you to the places in the city that you need to go. And we don't even have to talk about traffic. Everybody experiences trouble with that um, every day. And um, we certainly need to mention the issue of employment, uh, as that gives us access to all of these things that are important in life. Um, employment uh, is problematic because there's stagnating wages, uh, but also work organization is key. Uh, there was a survey done in our province recently showing that over half the jobs are to individuals with precarious jobs. What I mean by that is uh, they don't have benefits and they don't, they're dead end jobs. Um, there's not many opportunities to advance and certainly there's no job security associated with them. So um, cities are facing lots of inequalities and when it comes to trying to explain why those inequities are occurring, um, like good scholars, we look to the literature. And when we look to the literature, we found um, some disappointing trends. Um, and that is when these inequalities and inequities are discussed and presented, there tended to be a focus on um, uh, individual characteristics or personal behaviors and uh, those were the explanatory factors for these inequities. Uh, we might understand that you know some of the data sets that we use might promote uh, kind of a look at individual characteristics. But secondly, the disappointing trend is that they were very apolitical in their explanations of why these inequities were occurring. Uh, so we kind of took it upon ourselves to try and figure out how we could remedy this. One way to do it is to think about a framework which might introduce other key elements and key drivers of these inequities. So uh, we looked around as well to look at some of the existing frameworks and certainly we're all familiar with the social determinants framework, which is useful because it does identify those areas that we live and work. Um, however, it doesn't really tell us how those factors uh, improve or um, are detrimental to health. And there's even some frameworks that try and quantify the importance of these lifestyle factors. For example, minimizing healthcare and the environment in your genes and showing that it's mostly your life. But the quantification doesn't help us either because again, it's quite an apolitical explanation. So we did come up with our own framework um, and uh, we were trying to identify ways to understand all of those disparate issues, employment, food, um, housing uh, by using similar exp explanations. And uh, we drew heavily from some of the existing frameworks in um, say environment and public health, um, but none of them really focused on cities. You know, cities are more, more than just containers that contain people. Um, they're very much about processes, economic and political and social that generate these inequalities. So our framework starts with the inequities on the right uh, and it has those individual attributes um, and vulnerabilities that individuals have that make them unique um, and perhaps uniquely vulnerable. <clears throat> then we have the differential exposure to the conditions, the living conditions. Um, but really then we also identify and call out some of those city structures and processes whether it's governments, um, ideally democratic governments, but we know that they're very much influenced by political elites in the city, but then also challenged by some of the social movements. Um, going further upstream, cities are definitely uh, shaped by, and some of the features of cities are determined by national uh, political and economic processes. They might determine uh, the public purse, for example, or labor, 
uh, markets. And then finally, we can't ignore the ways in which some of these work together to create axes of inequality, gender, class, race, ability. And we can't ignore the ways in which the global, <clears throat> the global um, political and economic processes affect uh, nations and cities and vice versa. So I have run out of time. So I'm hoping that this uh, framework is useful uh, for understanding the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Kinney. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this really interesting book project. Um, I wrote a chapter on climate and health in cities, and let me tell you a little bit about that issue. Um, I was in Guangzhou, China earlier this week, um, attending an interesting conference on climate and health uh, at San Yat Sen University. And um, I was impressed in part uh, because of the expanding scope and really interesting work that's going on in China on climate and health. But I also was impacted as I s sat there by the I'd been traveling for about 10 days, and I was starting to really miss my granddaughter, who lives in the town next to me, south of Boston, little Ellis, who's a year old. She just started walking about a month ago. Um, you know, I'd, been, I'd usually see her a couple of times a week, so I was really missing her. But I was also kind of profoundly struck by the fact that, based on life expectancy, she's, gonna, she, she's likely to live to 2100, um, may, probably longer than that. And that's, that's basically the span of of data that we were looking at in these charts, um, you know, up to 2100, sea level rise, temperature rise, so sort of all the things that um, she's going to experience in her life. And it really sort of deeply impacted me in terms of the, um, the significance of, of these statistics that we talk about. Um, climate change is advancing rapidly, um, and unfortunately many of the changes that will, will continue for the next couple of decades, no matter what we do to control emissions, uh, because of the the inertia that's baked into the system from past emissions. Um, urban communities are facing increasing health risks from extreme heat events um, with patterns of vulnerability that relate to patterns of built environment, green space, uh, racial and, and economic divides, also age. Storms and flooding events are becoming more intense. Fires that are fueled by rising temperatures and also decreasing soil moisture are becoming more intense and lasting longer. Um, add to that the changes in air quality, pollen, mosquito and other infectious diseases. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of climate sensitive drivers that are shifting and that are affecting the health of cities. Uh, and it's important to note that extreme climate events such as heat waves and storm events um, cause immediate trauma and death and, and, and morbidity, but they also Set in, set in motion uh, changes in infrastructure, of both the built space, but also the social and, and health infrastructure that, that maintains a you know, healthy lifestyle. So the impacts of these events can, can, can continue for, for many months after they occur. Cities are really playing an increasingly important role in, in climate change. Um, cities dominate economic activity and also greenhouse gas emissions. They're also, um, they, they concentrate people in places that are often quite vulnerable to heat extremes and also to flooding and storm events. But cities are also centers of innovation and action and are incre increasingly taking a lead in generating the solutions to this problem. The challenge is really daunting. Um, cities need to both adapt to changes that are already happening but, but also simultaneously work as fast as possible to el eliminate the main driver of climate change, the burning of fossil fuels. This is the only way to ensure that we avoid truly catastrophic changes and impacts in cities uh, and that are, that are likely to occur in the latter half of this century if we don't take action quickly. The kind of world that our children and our grandchildren will, will inherit from us. How are we doing on solving the cr climate crisis? Well, at the international level, the news is not very good. Um, yesterday, the New York Times had an article pointing out that um, last year, greenhouse gas emissions on a global basis increased more than they had the last couple of years before that, you know, exactly the opposite direction that we ought to be going as a global society. Um, the global scientific community a couple of months ago um, 
uh, as embodied in an IPCC report, um, came to the conclusion that we really need to avoid letting the Earth warm more than 1.5 degrees Celsius beyond where it's gone so far um, this century to avoid the worst consequences for, for society, including human health. But to do that, we've got to get to net zero. We've got to get our emissions as a global society down to zero by 2050. And that's really a challenging task. Um, at the global scale with international negotiations, such as the ones that are just launching again in Poland this week, um, we've had trouble really reaching the agreements that would get us there. But I think it's important to continue that, that uh, dialogue. But in spite of that, I find a lot of hope in what's going on in cities. And that's really what we're talking about today. Cities around the world are beginning to lead us toward a zero carbon world by 2050. Boston's a great example. It set a zero carbon goal for 2050. Boston University, I'm proud to say, has actually been even more ambitious, setting a zero carbon net goal by 2040 for all of its campus operations. Um, I also find hope in the partnerships that are developing among key, key urban stakeholders. Um, the governance stake, uh, sector, academia, businesses, and also the philanthropists. Boston's Green Ribbon Commission is a really good example of such a partnership. At a more technical level, BU's um, Institute for Sustainable Cities is advising the Boston uh, government on how, what are the energy pathways that, that can be followed to get to this 2050 zero carbon goal. And the, the newly launched Urban Climate Research Initiative at BU is mustering talent from across the campus to um, look at the emission pathways, the health benefits, and the equity dimensions of those transitions that will occur and how to get there in, a most, in the most equitable and healthy way. So getting to zero carbon in cities will require really major societal transformations and will affect almost, I think, all of the sectors that we'll be hearing about today in, in, this, in this symposium. It'll have to occur while cities are adapting to the rapid changes that are already baked into the system, um, changes in, you know, increasing temperatures, rising sea levels, increasing storm intensities. And while we work to reduce economic and racial inequalities that exist in cities, we have a, it's, a, it's a tall order. But I am ca cautiously optimistic that we can get there, mainly because of the committed and creative work that's going on in cities. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Ah, that came up. Perfect. And I'm just trying to, how do I advance? Green button. The big green button. Great. I've got it. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm Kate Cagney from the University of Chicago in the Department of Sociology. And my charge um, through this exercise was to really think about how age matters and how the structure of cities reflect the age structure of society and how we might think about both the individual and contextual level determinants of older adult well-being. These data are going to be um, familiar to you certainly by the end of our conversation, but I did want to point out that what makes the conversations about age so critical are that our increasingly older age structure is also um, coupled with rapid urbanization. And as we know, globally, 962 million people, 60 plus, um, exist, right, in our world. Um, and the greatest percentage of older adults rest in Europe right now. The U.S. population also is growing at rapid rate. Um, people, right, demographers in particular, are looking at what drives those kinds of factors, like rising life expectancy and falling fertility. Um, and as David pointed out earlier, about half our population right now um, is in urban context. But by 2050, about right, two thirds will be. Um, so, how do we consider aging populations? How do they affect cities? Um, and how should cities view age and aging? And how do we think about the opportunities and challenges of population aging? So, I want to again sort of emphasize how we can think about aging on the individual level and aging on the contextual level. So, on the individual level, we think about concepts like age in place, where people are growing older in the communities that they might have moved to in early adulthood, and the embeddedness that older adults both feel and bring to communities. So, we can think about that through network ties, through long tenure of home ownership. 
But I really want to emphasize the contextual level, and that's where the sociological component comes in, where we think about how the structure, the physical structure of our communities and the social processes that emerge from it are in part driven by age. So we can think about the age structure communities, the built and social environment, our neighborhoods accommodating or not for older adults. We want to think about segregation related to race and class, but also to age and how that might matter. And we're going to look at a few graphics related to that in a moment. Um, and then, you know, we think about, again, aging on the individual level and people choosing to stay in place. Um, but we want to think about how that matters at the contextual level. So, um, you know, as my editors pointed out, um, it was important to include in this chapter the notion of naturally occurring retirement communities and the extent to which they are creating new spaces for older adults um, to age in place in urban context. And again, we want to think of issues like residential mobility. And I'm, I, I will close our conversation today thinking a little bit about the notion of activity spaces, so not just where people um, have a, you know, or, or you know, own a home, what their residential location is, but actually where they spend time, their circumference of turf and how and when they use neighborhoods. And so we'll talk a bit about that. So I'm going to show you four slides that just underscore our changing age structure. Uh, this is the United States, of course, um, and this is 2000 and 2016. We see that the median age for adults um, in rural areas is 51 as compared to 45 in urban space. And so the idea, right, that we're mostly seeing this, this dramatic shift in age structure in rural and suburban context, but those are not alone. And we also see it in an urban environment, and I'll show you that now. But I just, yeah, visually, that's quite striking. So here again, we see the metropolitan, micropolitan, a small town and rural area shift in its age structure, again, from 2000 to 2016. So not as dramatic in urban space, but still something that we need to be attentive to. So um, I spend a lot of time both living in Chicago, but also studying it, and wanted to really take you from sort of the national to the local. Um, and so wanted to show you here, too, this is the age structure in 2000 and in 2016 in the city of Chicago, and then the change in the population percentage points. And again, what you'll notice here is that certainly that the city is aging, but one of the things I really want you to be attentive to is the extent to which we are seeing some communities age at much more rapid rates than others, and we see pretty significant age segregation. And so what we're seeing is that potentially communities are or not particularly um, attentive to the needs of more vulnerable populations, including older adults. And so we want to think about what that might mean for concepts like intergenerational transmission of information, the extent to which right, kids might see older adults on the street, develop those sorts of relationships, and make certain that, again, we're thinking about communities that can be accommodating to people across the life course. So because I, I love thinking about the microenvironment, old Chicago School of Sociology, work and the idea, right, that uh, emergent principles come from social interaction and community. I show you one just to really dig in on this idea of um, communities and their structures. So this is Bridgeport in the city of Chicago. This is an old, actually, Irish neighborhood where the Daly family came from. Um, and what I wanted to show you here is that we also we see rapid right, change in age structure in the city from, or in this community from 2000 to 2016, but we also see gentrification coming in. So we see a little bit of a bimodal shape to Bridgeport. And what we'd want to think about is a community, right, that would have these two very different sorts of representations. And how should that neighborhood both reflect those needs and accommodate this new age structure? So really just want to think broadly again about aging and context and the kinds of considerations that we might um, that we might uh, discuss. So we want to think about the physical infrastructure, what things are important for older adults, lighting on sidewalks, and, um, and you know, the ability to maneuver in community. We've spent a lot of time in our research team thinking about who lived and died during the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And in large part, um, people died in neighborhoods that were physically and socially isolated, and they died in communities that didn't have act active commercial venues. And we believe that that means that the extent to which people could felt comfortable going outdoors in time of need and had destinations to go to to cool off mattered a lot for who lived and who died. So that's both a physical consideration, a social consideration. Um, and we want to think about the contributions that older adults make. I think there is a, a dialogue at, at which we might feel that um, there's a crisis because our cities are getting older. And so I think we want to also think about the resources that might come from a shifting age structure. So um, 
I also like to read uh, Jane Jacobs' book, Death and Life of Great American Cities. I don't know if any of you have read that, right? Still a very important work with this idea of eyes on the street, informal monitoring. A lot of that comes from older adults who participate in community. I also want to think about the collective orientation of community. That comes um, in large part from the work of Rob Sampson uh, here in Boston and thinking about the idea that we look out for one another in time of crisis. This idea of age is capital, um, some early work by Linda Freed, now at the Columbia School of Public Health, thinking about experience core and where older adults could go into um, schools and help with tutoring. It uh, had outcomes in terms of, of things like dementia onset, right? So it was protective for the older adults engaged and, and um, was great for the students whose test scores rose. Uh, so we want to think about those pieces. I won't spend a lot of time thinking about new data and measurement approaches, although I'll close with a couple slides related to that, but thinking about how we might measure the way older adults maneuver in community, tracking them, for instance, with iPhones and using um, methods like ecological momentary assessment. Um, and then I think we want to think about what we can learn from one another. David was the one who pointed this out to me, the WHO age-friendly world series of programs that foster an inclusive environment and gives a platform for over 600 cities to share the kinds of strategies they're using to incorporate older adults into community and to assist people aging in place. So I will close with um, three different slides. So I mentioned we have this study in the city of Chicago where we follow older adults with iPhones and we want to try to understand where they go. We're just out of the field right now and so I'm going to show you this is where older African Americans travel in our city older Latinos, and older whites. So 450 respondents. And I'll leave you with the notion that what's interesting to us is that it seems that older adults in the city um, travel from um, their sort of neighborhood of origin to another neighborhood with, with the same racial composition, regardless of other sort of social and physical features of the community. And so I think that's an important um, you know, first finding from our analysis is the extent to which um, people seem to gravitate toward communities in which they might feel welcome and that there might be also physical and social barriers, which mean um, that people are not resting in communities next to them, but again, traversing um, those that are not same race. So I am over time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, I'm Dan Cass. Um, uh, I have been asked to kind of lay, lay the stage for why city health departments matter and uh, some of the constraints on their ability to realize their sort of purpose in addressing uh, all of the sort of issues we've been talking about even uh, already this morning around health. Um, you know, as others have noted, the determinants of health of urban populations has, uh, you know, little and less so, uh, less over time to deal with health care and is decreasingly determined by infectious disease. Um, and the key to improvement has little to do with the typical authority of the public health system. Health is increasingly determined by social and physical conditions, psychosocial stressors, nutrition, environment, urban design, racial and economic segregation, early childhood development factors that will affect the life course over the course of, uh, uh, that affect the life course, and on and on. Uh, and noteworthy to all of these is that none of, the, none of these domains are, uh, are typically within the domain of control for uh, public health systems, let alone local health departments. Um, the paths to solving these are many. Uh, I want to point out that, you know, just as government played sometimes nefarious and intentional roles to help create these kinds of conditions uh, and often neglected to act to prevent them, it is necessary, perhaps insufficient, to solve them. And city health departments uh, are or can be at the core of these efforts to influence advances in healthcare, food systems, housing quality and access, active transit, and the social, physical, and built environments uh, that promote equity, well-being, and health. City governments historically were the drivers of public health practice in many U.S. states in the 19th and, 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, typical functions then included the control of infectious disease and provision of clinical or supportive services for vulnerable populations. And to the extent that these uh, issues were associated with urban squalor and density, and given the limitations at the time of scientific knowledge, they typically entailed engaging broadly around sanitation, physical and built environments that promote e equity, uh, uh, well-being and, uh, sorry, that um, entailed uh, 
dealing with sanitation, housing, urban design, safety systems, the very same things that are necessary today. But the trends over the 20th century uh, drew health departments away from these traditional domains of focus. Uh, and what we're finding today is that local health departments are transitioning back with very ex varying success and with a variety of constraints. And I want to talk a little bit about sort of what some of those constraints are. Um, but I also want to talk about sort of the, the opportunity, why cities' government matters uh, around, around these issues. Uh, first, um, city government, uh, obviously, is closer to the population that they serve than other jurisdictional bounds, like state or federal uh, or regional governments. Um, they're able to serve community-level needs, uh, and especially they're able to understand and address intra-urban variability, uh, a, f a key feature that we've already seen this morning in the presentations. Um, uh, city governments are poised better than any other uh, government entity and usually better than uh, anyone in civil society, including academic partners, to really characterize and track changes in this kind of interurban variability. Uh, city governments are directly engaged with civil society organizations that are essential partners for uh, advocating for policy changes and implementing those changes um, uh, at, at, on the ground. City governments uh, typically demonstrate much greater nimbleness around cross-sectoral collaboration uh, than do other, uh, than do state uh, health uh, departments and state government generally. Um, and I think importantly, and I say this from the experience of having spent 16 years at the New York City Health Department, rightly or wrongly, city dwellers perceive their local government to be responsible for their, for their well-being and blame them when, uh, you know, uh, independent of authority or jurisdictional uh, boundaries when, uh, when things go wrong. So city governments are on the hook whether they like it or not. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for city health departments to broaden their spheres of influence, um, but I, I think it's fair to say that they're largely uh, unrealized um, in, uh, in most of the cities globally and, and in the United States. So why is that? So one thing to sort of reckon with is that the size of city health departments uh, varies dramatically from a staff to population ratio. Uh, you know, in the United States, they may vary by uh, a factor of 10. So not all city governments are equally positioned, staffed, uh, or funded to do it. On the funding size, on the funding side rather, um, depending on the size of a city health department, um, it may be very heavily dependent on state agencies for resources and therefore direction. Um, federal financing uh, typically flows for, uh, for uh, for uh, traditional core public health functions, less and less around the non-infectious uh, disease control and prevention. Um, and typically, federal funding flows to states, uh, entirely bypassing cities. Um, as a result, uh, most city health departments suffer from underinvestment in non-communicable disease surveillance, policy formation, and staffing generally. Uh, another constraint is varying legal authority. Um, you know, as public health practice matures and re-engages with the physical and social conditions under which people live, the key levers of public health are increasingly legislative and regulatory. But public health authority generally rests with states and not cities. In tobacco control, food policy, chronic disease control, for example, uh, states typically have far greater authority and, the, and in some areas, like in, uh, in mental health, substance use policy, uh, alcohol, uh, policy, there are specific preemptions from local authority, uh, really disabling local governments from taking actions that, that uh, only they may well understand, that they may garner support for, um, and that are really necessary to address the inequities uh, caused by those conditions. Um, so how are city health departments managing around this? Uh, in our chapter uh, uh, on the role of city health departments, we highlight uh, the health and all policies approach to addressing uh, urban health, the idea that health considerations should be central to decision making uh, uh, well outside the traditional sphere of direct influence of public health governmental authority, land use planning, uh, transportation decisions, education, employment, economic development programs. Uh, and to achieve this, health and all policies uh, will require health departments in cities to fully engage um, and participate in an integrative governance approach. On the other hand, we also argue that um, there's a, while well, health and all policies is a useful, a useful framework, especially for helping overcome authority and fiscal constraints, 
Uh, in the context of local government, it often fails, um, and it does so in part by advocates for health and health policy shooting themselves in the foot in a lot of ways by over-promising. After all, we can't quantify the specific impacts of every cause, decision, policy uh, option uh, as much as the notion of health and health policies uh, pledges to do. It tends to lead to territorialism and anxiety on the part of other city agencies because, after all, city agencies always believe that the work that they're doing is for the health and well-being of the, of the public. And so this kind of, um, so, so how to sort of get past that, you know, we, we, we think that the best examples for this rest with health impact assessment. And later today you're going to hear about at least one or more examples of the way in which uh, health impacts assessment uh, as a kind of tool of surveillance and epidemiology has driven policies outside the traditional regulatory sphere of uh, public health departments. Um, an example that, uh, that from my own experience was in New York City at the Health Department uh, where we uh, launched a, um, a surveillance program to characterize air quality across the city and the variability across the city. It was also able to identify sources that pre were previously unknown, the most important one having to do with high sulfur uh, heating oil. Uh, this role that the health department played, after all, we didn't regulate air quality, we didn't issue permits for air pollution, we didn't, uh, uh, we didn't uh, sort of oversee um, you know, heating uh, and, uh, uh, and fuel systems for buildings, but highlighting this uh, was able to provide the grist, the economic rationale, uh, and health benefit estimates to drive policy changes that ultimately resulted in the phase out of this, this particular oil leading uh, contributing to about 800 saved lives a year from reduced sulfur dioxide pollution and particulates. Um, Kelly, in her introduction, mentioned the Partnership for Healthy Cities, which is an, a, part, uh, a program at, out of Bloomberg Philanthropies that Vital Strategies, where I currently work, uh, provides technical assistance and implementation assistance to many of the cities. And a feature uh, of much of what uh, Kelly focused on in terms of the kinds of interventions that were uh, that uh, it's involved in is that health departments in most of these cities are either leading or driving much of the leadership for these actions, even though the health department uh, is, not the, is not responsible for transportation systems, for environment, for uh, necessarily for food policy. It's surveillance uh, that's at the core of these activities, the power of convening that a health department has, and typically the skills that reside in, a, in, in the public health sector uh, more than other ones for, uh, for gathering and promoting intersectoral collaborations. So uh, uh, that said, we've also learned some initial lessons from this effort that include uh, sort of important things for health departments going forward. The first is that um, leadership matters independent of governmental activity. Uh, with uh, mayoral buy-in, it's, uh, it's hard to get in a lot of these cities where this work is going on, but, it's, but it is critical, and when it does happen, it makes a, an, enor an enormous difference. I've talked about the challenge of authority of city health departments. Um, uh, that remains a, a challenge, um, but, uh, but it can be overcome. And in many cities, there is really little precedent um, for cross-sectoral collaboration. And city health departments may be eager, uh, but are often constrained by culture and practice from, uh, from asserting a role that they might, uh, that they might play with, uh, with data influence and uh, the ability to mobilize populations to really support other agencies' actions. So we think health departments are critical. Um, they have varying and often unrealized potential to drive significant improvements in the social and physical conditions of cities that drive health and equity. But um, often their role, as I've said, is, influence, is influential rather than uh, direct. So I want to um, close uh, with a, a pitch to our academic partners. Um, I think academic institutions can really support the strengthening um, of city health departments by fostering collaborations that use and enhance local data. I know many are doing it. Boston University is certainly one example. Um, uh, universities increasingly need to, and public health schools in particular, need to uh, prepare multidisciplinary workforces uh, that are needed to support this kind of work. Um, public health master's curricula can be less specialized and even within specializations really can uh, help prepare people for playing these cross-sectoral roles um, that teach the skills of advocacy, collaboration, and public engagement. And in terms of scholarship, um, I think one of the things that we lament 
for those of us that have worked in government, um, is that there's really a paucity of research on this kind, on what works. What, uh, as as I keep advocating for cross-sectoral work, you know, w there's very little out there to sort of guide and to analyze what is effective, what isn't. What are the preconditions, uh, both in government structure and in um, civil society, to uh, allow it to thrive and work? Uh, what are examples? Uh, you know, those of us in practice can do a better job. Um, providing case studies, but we really count on academic partners, um, both in public health schools and public administration schools uh, and others to uh, really uh, drive um, uh, an an a, a scholarship agenda around intersectoral collaboration and uh, for us to learn lessons to help accelerate this work. Um, the the uh, last thing I want to sort of say is I want to make a nod to the importance of increasing public health authority at the city level. I've already identified that it's a fairly significant constraint, um, but this really does need to change. There are some cities, uh, San Francisco, New York City, others, that have uh, uh, boards of public health that have broad uh, authority to legislate, uh, both in collaboration with and often independent of, um, of legislative bodies at, at the city level, but most cities don't. Uh, this requires a change. It re uh, as Pat just pointed out, cities are really the center of innovation around climate and other, uh, and other matters. And so to do that will require, uh, it requires activity, it requires uh, a movement to be built, it requires a public demand for greater local authority. And uh, we would love to see that this become a, uh, a rallying cry. Um, it will require a champion, champion, it requires a political strategy, it requires simultaneous actions around jurisdictions, but we think the time is right. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Vogel. I'm from the University of Missouri-St. Louis in the uh, Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to contribute to what I see as a very important volume, and then for inviting me here to speak with you guys today. Now, given the time constraints, I'm going to keep my comments brief, I promise, highlighting what I see as the key trends in the current state of knowledge on urban crime. I'll also briefly summarize what I view as the most pressing issues of crime and justice facing American cities today, and time permitting, I'll try to highlight some promising directions to make our cities safer. Now, while my comments will be very general in nature, I'm happy to elaborate, assuming there's time at the end uh, for the question and answer. So let me begin with three broad observations about crime in American cities. And in doing so, I hope to dispel some common uh, misperceptions. First, it should come as no surprise that crime is most heavily concentrated in urban areas. And indeed, cities boast a disproportionate amount of crime compared to suburban or rural locales. Now that being said, crime rates have dropped significantly in urban areas over the last 30 years. And despite some recent uptakes, upticks in places like Chicago and Baltimore and St. Louis, crime rates today parallel those experienced in the late 1960s, a time some might argue when America was truly great. <laughs> Finally, crime and violence are not uniformly distributed across urban space. Instead, crime rates vary substantially from neighborhood to neighborhood, with a handful of places responsible for the vast majority of criminal activity. So to briefly elaborate upon these observations, from roughly the mid-1970s through the early 1990s, crime rates were increasing steadily across the United States. This upward trend actually stopped rather abruptly around 1991, and rates of violence in particular dropped by over a third by the end of the decade. Now, there has been considerable theorizing about this great American crime decline. For instance, some have pointed to innovations in policing, like Dean Galea here, such as broken windows policing, the eradication of the crack cocaine market, and mass incarceration as the likely culprits. Others have pointed to uh, policies, such as the Clean Air Act of 1970, or Roe v. Wade, in limiting the number of potential offenders. Others have pointed to uh, sort of local economic conditions, such as shifting unemployment rates or low levels of inflation, while still others have talked about community investment activities, such as the proliferation of nonprofits as driving these trends. Now, while explanations abound, the drop in violent crime from the 1990s through today is likely attributed to a variety of factors operating in tandem, not one single underlying cause. But the point I'm trying to make here is that urban crime rates today are near historic lows. Now that being said, 
crime and violence remain a salient feature of urban life and a persistent public health concern, the reason I believe I'm here today. And more importantly, the impact of crime and violence in our criminal justice policies as well are not evenly distributed across urban neighborhoods. Crime tends to cluster in places with other indicators of structural disadvantage, social disorder, and most importantly, in areas with the highest concentration of minority residents. Importantly though, neighborhoods themselves tend to be rather heterogeneous. Crime rates vary substantially from street to street within the same census tract, within the same census block group. And a common observation in my line of work is that roughly 5% of the addresses in a city account for over 50% of all crime. And these hotspots, as they're commonly called, are really what drives urban crime rates. So the trends I've just described have given rise to a number of innovative, let's say, criminal justice practices. And I'll start with the good. The recognition that crime is concentrated at small geographic scales has led to the development of what we call hotspots policing, or the targeting of law enforcement to the highest crime areas in the city. And indeed, findings from a growing number of randomized control trials suggest that when police focus their efforts on hotspots, crime goes down, which is good. However, not all modern policing tactics boast the same results. And in some, instead, some practices have had rather nefarious consequences. Take New York City's stop, question, and frisk policy, for instance. Under this directive, officers in New York City were allowed to, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, if they believed somebody was in the process of committing a crime or had committed a crime, they could stop the suspect. And if the officer felt that he or she was in danger, he or she could pat down the exterior of the suspect for weapons. And indeed, as I'm sure many of you know, these stops overwhelmingly targeted young men of color in predominantly low-income neighborhoods. And as I'm sure you also know, the New York State Supreme Court put an end to this practice a few years ago. Now, I'm not trying to harp on New York City sitting here in Boston. Instead, what I wish to emphasize, thank you, what I wish to emphasize is that aggressive policing and ultimately mass incarceration have disproportionately affected low-income minority communities. And such differential contact can erode public trust, leading those most likely to be affected by our criminal justice policies to cast law enforcement in a negative light. And as a result, the most disadvantaged of our communities are often characterized by a high degree of what we refer to as legal cynicism, or the belief that law enforcement is illegitimate, unresponsive, and ill-equipped to handle uh, public safety. And this cynicism can be problematic as it increases the likelihood that people are going to solve disputes with violence rather than with formal police mediation. And this has been amplified in recent years due to the highly publicized and often politicized uh, cases of officer use of deadly force. The shooting death of Michael Brown in my adopted city is but one of many examples as of late. And some have even argued that the increasing media attention and ensuing public uh, unrest are partly responsible for the increase in urban crime rates in some places from 2015 to 2017, uh, the so-called Ferguson effect, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Now, given the theme of this conference, allow me to conclude by reiterating what I see as two of the biggest crime and criminal justice issues affecting the health of American cities today. Concentrated violence and strained police community relationships in low-income communities of color. And I want to be clear that we can't begin addressing the former without addressing the latter. And more importantly, I want to stress that the responsibility of reducing crime does not rest solely on the shoulders of law enforcement. It also requires coordinated efforts among healthcare providers, social service agencies, academics, public health departments, religious leaders, nonprofits, schools, to name just a few. As the root causes of criminal violence are multifaceted, so too must be the solutions. To close, while urban crime rates have dropped considerably over the past 30 years, the spatial distribution of crime and violence suggests there's still considerable work to be done to make all places healthier and all of our citizens safer. Thank you. I just want to ask the panelists to come up. I think we have about mm, 10 minutes, maybe a little bit less for questions from the audience. So if everyone could come up. Thank you. 
Okay, I have actually a lot of questions, but I think, um, I think that because we're pretty short on time, I'm gonna ask the audience if anyone would like to start us off with a question because I, I don't wanna hog the stage. Carlos, did you, did you wanna start with a question? I'll speak up. Um, there you go. Thank you very much, excellent panel. Patricia, uh, the framework is very comprehensive and sounds very exciting. Well, how much have you worked towards the operationalization of that framework? And you know, what do you do with all that understanding? Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yes, in seven minutes we can't describe it all. What, one is to really understand the root causes and how they're related not just to the immediate environment that a person lives in, but it's related to um, you know, larger city processes, larger national and global processes. You know, we might understand, um, for example, the economic um, uh, downturn in 2008 as something that's very much related to cities. Um, it was related to the subprime mortgage lending uh, that was about development in cities and in suburban areas. Um, and then that kind of brought the financial world down and that affected the rest of the globe. Uh, so it originated in cities and then it came back and it affected cities with foreclosures, et cetera. So um, understanding that full um, set of factors uh, helps us understand um, how inequalities are generated in that way, but also solutions. So hopefully you saw that in the uh, framework, um, it's not just about going one way and inequality is getting worse, but the ways in which we can challenge some of the power structures that exist um, that are trying to increase uh, inequalities or um, have wealth move up the ladder rather than uh, be better distributed. Uh, so solutions like um, some of the work that's going on uh, around the US, for example, the Poor People's Campaign that's trying to challenge the ways in which racial inequalities are generated, um, how people are being treated in prisons, so we can identify um, the points in which we can intervene. That's the idea. A question over here? Yes. Yes, my name is Agis Tsuros. I, I just wanted to share something uh, with you. I have worked in with European cities for more than 20 years trying to promote an equity and social determinants agenda. I can tell you this. I think we tend to super intellectualize this work. It is very difficult very often to be understood by those who work at the coal face in cities. Uh, it is a misunderstanding that these agendas can be possibly taken on by uh, health departments. This is health in all policies, social determinants, inequalities are goals to be embraced by whole of city governments. It will never happen uh, through the even the strongest leadership of a health department. It will have to be a whole city kind of uh, approach. And lastly, I would like to say I feel uh, for, for what it is, the concept of health in all policies, uh, and the country that, uh, that produced it, Finland, uh, it, to, it would be a pity, uh, although it is very important to, to also do uh, health impact assessments, to just limit it to, uh, to that kind of function. It is a much broader and it has much more promising for health promotion concept. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Is there no, there's a question up here in the front row. There you go. Thank you, Helen Pinio from University College London. Thank you for your fascinating presentations. It was actually a question for you about the paucity of research you said on in relation to the cross-sectoral policies, and I think it's picking up on what uh, Agus said as well, that I, I was curious because we have what works centers for various policy objectives. And we also have the WHO Healthy Cities Movement that's done a lot in that area. What are the kind of key gaps that you think really are needed more, more research in terms of the structures of government? Or could you elaborate a bit on that? Uh, so I think one of them, uh, a, key, a key sort of question is the, um, the, the adaptation of successful policy implementation across sort of different 
conditions, jurisdictions, countries. Um, I think you know, there's. I, 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 I'm not suggesting there's a shortage of information about their about sort of policy impact because I think there is. I think the question is more around sort of how it, it how its transferability, the conditions that allow for that, uh, the um, and uh, you know a kind of evaluation of uh, what what factors lead to or in, or hinder success. So I think I think a lot of it has to do with transferability and and that sort of stuff. I think. Uh, on the question of cross-sectoral uh, success, I think uh, sort of the, the, there are a lot of sort of questions that are not easily answered about sort of what models uh, work for what kinds of programs. Uh, you know, should things be agency-led? How much is how critical is leadership? Um, uh, or uh, you know, sort of at a city level, mayoral buy-in? Can how can those been, things be um, circumvented if they're if they're absent? Uh, the role of civil society in some of these policies and the kind of pathway for uh, for uh, laying the groundwork for them, right? That that sort of stuff. So I think typically the research is very effective at evaluating, you know, the uh, sort of what what is behind a policy, what uh, implementation looks like, and whether and how it's successful. But around these other issues, I think it's less. We have a lot of questions. You want to go right here? Yeah. Sure. Um, Dustin Duncan. Uh, so my question is for Matt Vogel about police violence within neighborhoods. <clears throat> so the, 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 the bulk of your talk was about interventions, but my strong sense is that there is still uh, under quantification and tremendous misclassification in terms of the accuracy of police violence, particularly within certain communities, especially um, and in certain geographies. So my question is, and, and I guess one quick response is that my sense is that the onus is not just on the police department in terms of not just the interventions, but quantifying actually who's getting murdered and where and why and how, et cetera. My question is, what are, what are your senses in terms of how we can improve the, the quantification of actual police violence within neighborhoods? In, hi. So if I understand correctly, you're talking about officer-involved shootings primarily, police yeah. violence. Uh, one of the major issues, so my colleague is David Klinger. It's a shame he's not here today because this is what he studies. The largest issue, and I think the way to move forward, is there's actually no national database. There is no quantification, so our numbers are really kind of scant. When somebody is murdered or somebody dies, we, we have a lot of information on that. When someone is shot, which is far more common, parallel, injured, or paralyzed, injured, we have far less information. So some sort of movement to actually compile that data, make it publicly available at a small geographic scale, I think would go a long way. Now, what do we have to do to get there? I have no idea. But that would be how to move forward. Thanks for the question. There's a question over here on this side of the room. There we go. OK. Um, it's, um, so the. Uh, the problem solution of the framework with social determinants um, that I see are multi-generational. So um, maybe finding a solution um, to market, um, find, take an initiative of marketing a solution to take to the policymakers um, in a way that, that we, we don't seem to be saying the same thing over and over again. I think we need to use the, the um, terminology multi-generational, um, maybe put that in theory, and then put it into practice and see if we could come out with a result like that. Um, I'm not sure, but we need to, um, it's perpetual, but I think it, it's also multi-generational. Thank you for that comment, I agree. We only have about a minute left. I'm going to jump in. Kathleen, I wanted to ask you, actually, um, I think in, in the world of climate, you know, there's this concern about it's, it's in the future, so it's not an immediate. People think it's too far ahead. It's not this minute. I think that's changing now as we're seeing more and more things happening. But it's a little bit true with aging, too, no? The idea that, well, you know, I'm pretty good right now. I'm not old. I can do what I do. I'm pretty, I'm pretty active. Do you, do you have some, you, you mentioned in your presentation there's some opportunities that we could, we could glom onto around this, this issue. Do you want to comment more on what those are and, and how we get overcome this idea that it's in the future, we don't really have to worry about it right now? Yeah, I guess, oh, thank you. <laughs> I guess when I was thinking about this, con the, the context of opportunity was really one of, uh, I, uh, Really, one you know, drawing out that idea of you know, I use the exa example of Experience Corps, but the extent to which there are many resources that come from 
uh, older adults, you know, years of training, right? All these other ways in which they might also be connected to community. You could imagine incorporating people, let's say post-retirement, in more functional ways, having, having other kinds of policies like a more graded retirement that you know, would allow for people to participate more in community. And then I think, you know, I think another opp opportunity, if you will, which is really something um, related to the state, I, I might argue, of some crisis, is thinking about how we provide um, health care and long-term care to older adults. I had this fascinating conversation yesterday with somebody who's um, developing an experiment at UCSF where right now we can all begin to volunteer and then we put that volunteer work in a bank and then we can withdraw hours of long-term care and potentially home health care from the bank that we put in at earlier stages of the life course. And I see that as a particular opportunity or way to reconceive how we might manage that challenge. Great, thank you very much. We're over time, but thank you to all the panelists and, and, for, and for all your great presentations.